my mana potion. Somehow it's already May. I don't know how that happened. I graduate in a month. I'm going to be completely done with my Bachelor of Arts and if all goes according to plan I'm then going to start doing a Masters because I'm afraid to leave the structure of the school system. But we're not here to complain about me today. This month I am going to be participating in the Asian Readathon organised by the wonderful Read with Sid Cindy. I nearly said Read with Sydney, that's where I live. Hey, I haven't made a video in like a million years. I need more mana. The point of this readathon is basically to showcase Asian writers, um, settings, characters, cultures, and all those sort of other aspects of Asian identity which is so often overlooked in the predominantly white book industry. So, Cindy has set up a couple of challenges for us. Um, we have to read a book that has, was originally written in the author's native language and was later translated into English. Um, we have to re read a book that features uh, intersectional identity, so as well as being about uh, from uh, an Asian writer and possibly potentially about the Asian experience, but you know, potentially not. Also about a different experience, such as being a religious minority, being um, someone with a disability, being of a gender or sexual minority, like me. Um, you know. The things that come under that whole umbrella of people who get fucked over on this wonderful planet of ours. Um, another prompt is to read a graphic novel. And we have to read... Have to. I say this like it's some great chore. We're going to read a group novel which is A Thousand Beginnings and Endings edited by... What's her name? Ellen O. Oh, uh, it's very good to have an author whose surname is only two letters. Because I forgot her first name, but I'm never going to forget her last name. These wonderful works that are uh, retellings of myths from across Asia, which I'm really excited to read, because I honestly don't know much about mythology from the majority of countries. I mean, just the majority of countries. I know, like, Greco-Roman mythology. I know, like, the absolute barest sliver of minimum of some indigenous Australian uh, Dreamtime stories, which get sanitized a lot when they're passed down to us uh, in the public school system. Nordic mythology, I guess, I know. I don't even know that much about Celtic mythology and like, that's where I'm from, so... <sighs> Believe it or not, I was actually one of those mythology kids in school, but I didn't read Percy Jackson, so I feel like that's where I failed in becoming a mythology gay and I became a medieval fantasy gay instead, which is like a couple of thousand years in the future. Not as far as being a sci-fi gay. If you're a modern gay, then like, okay. Whatever. If you're a 1920s gay, DM me. So if you could actually make sense of the weird tangent I went on. Um, basically there's one core challenge, which is read a book by an Asian author, obviously, and then there are the four sub-challenges where if you want to like fully complete the readathon, you have to read books that manage to tick each of those boxes. And uh, I'm actually a huge fan of Nagata Kabi, who wrote My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, which was originally published in Japanese about obviously being gay and mental health issues, and is a graphic novel, so it sort of just gets them all. Oops. Um, so I'm reading, well, I say reading. I managed to stop myself from reading it before May, and then on the 1st of May I just absolutely inhaled it. Um, so yeah, I'm reading My Solo Exchange Diary Volume 2, which is kind of, it's marketed as the sequel series to My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, which I, it is, in that it is a continuation of the mangaka's autobiographical description of her life. And she actually talks about how that has impacted her here, where she's basically selling her life a piece at a time, and obviously because she struggles with mental health issues, that's not exactly um, an easy thing to deal with. I, I'm not going to go ahead and say it's like a big... Pr it's 
like a bad thing for her to be doing, but it is a unique challenge that she has to face on top of all the other stuff that she was originally writing about. Um, so since I've already read this one, because it is a, a, a slim graphic novel, I couldn't stop myself. I told you I'm a big fan of hers. Um, this checks all of the boxes except for be this book. Um, so technically, once I, I read A Thousand Beginnings and Endings, I've completed the challenge, but I feel bad about doing that um, because the point of the challenge is to expand your horizons and I was definitely going to read this already. So I decided to read some other books um, that some of them meet the challenge criteria, some of them are just books by an Asian author, and I've bought a couple, um, but some of them I'll be able to read quickly, some of them I might take a long time doing, so I've only bought a, a few. Hopefully I'll be able to read more than I have in this pile here, um, because I don't actually have anything else that was written in the author's native language and then translated. Um, and I was really looking forward to reading more of that, because I have not read any Murakami yet, and I really want to. But at the same time, I have just read something that was originally published in Japanese, and a lot of the point of this challenge was to expand your horizons beyond a lot of what you're familiar with. and. In case you couldn't tell by the everything, I have read a lot of manga. <laughs> so, um, stick around for a discussion of this in a bit more detail. Um, but, continuing on to my TBR, the thing that I'm currently reading at the moment, which also fits the challenge, is The Prince and the Dressmaker. Me bad with names. It's by someone Wang. I don't know her first name. What is it? It's Jen. Jen Wang. She's Chinese American um, and she wrote and drew this entire graphic novel, which is a big hardcover comic novel. Graphic novel. It's a big boy. And I love it. I'm, I'm this far into it and it is so good already. I am like... Okay, you know how in cartoons they do that thing where they try to capture someone by putting like a really obvious piece of bait under a cardboard box, there's a stick, and <laughs> the person they capture runs in to grab the bait and they pull the stick and the box falls down on them? If you wanted to capture me like that, you would just need to put like LGBT graphic novels under the box and I would see the box and I would still go for it. I have been meaning to read this for a long time because I have uh, a vested interest in LGBT children's media because I didn't get any of it while I was an LGBT children. And I'm making up for it now. I'm currently going through a Moomin phase which is written by the incredible lesbian Tove Janssen who later retired and just lived on an island in the sea with her wife forever which is the dream. Back to this, I've only read half of it so far, but the art is really stunning. It's set in, um, I guess you would say, it's described as the golden age of Paris, and it definitely comes across as feeling that lush, dramatic city of love, city of light, city of fashion and drama type stuff, um, with, you know, the beauty of Versailles. It's, it's interesting because it's like, I guess it's an alternate history. Well, obviously it's an alternate history because they have the beginnings of electricity, but also uh, a monarchy. Um, but this Prince Sebastian is identified as the Prince of Belgium. He's just in Paris. So I guess it's sort of up in the air if the French monarchy, monarchy still exists, but there is definitely still a strong aristocracy there. All this is to say is that the Aesthetics is incredible, absolutely gorgeous costumes, settings, just character design that really- oh, Look at how cute Frances is! She's adorable, don't you want to root for her? Um, the same goes for Sebastian. He's got this enormous nose, which I just love in character designs. Um, I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> So, I haven't finished it yet, obviously, because this is a TBR video, I guess. This is the ramblings of an insane man. This is a TBR video. This is to be completed, but I'm enjoying every minute of it, and probably the second I finish filming this, I will pick this book up 
and without moving or taking off this uncomfortable outfit, we'll finish it. After I've gotten through my graphic novel binge, I'm probably going to um, read Thousand Beginnings and Endings because it is the group book and that is something I just want to, you know, get on to make sure that I actually do read it because I'm really interesting, really interested in the live stream with Cindy and her co-hosts as they talk about it. And I'm cool, I'm keen to get in on that discussion and like I said, I am really interested in learning more about these myths, um, which I have had zero prior exposure to before. So that's next. Um, and after that, uh, the two other books that I bought. Both are fantasy books. This one is a sci-fi fantasy. It's called Mirage and it's by... And I don't remember people's names and I don't even look at books when I make a video. It's by Samaya Dord. Samaya is a Muslim British woman who is... I think this is her very first book. Yes. Um... Seems so. They certainly don't tell me to go out and buy other books by her, which they jump at the chance to do for anyone who has another book to buy. Um, but I'm very interested in the plot of this one. Um, it's got quite a few Arabic influences, as you can tell just from the incredible cover design, but also Samaya um, specifically mentions her interest in Arabic art, language and culture, which I'm really excited to see come through. Um, but it's, like I said, a sci-fi fantasy about a, a young girl who lives in an isolated part of an empire, growing up just sort of on her own, thinking she's nothing special, you know, as all good fantasy stories start. Um, but this is a galactic empire, she's on an isolated little moon, and she gets kidnapped and brought to the royal palace because she is identical to the princess, and she's to serve as a double, a body double, for the princess, because this princess is so cruel and hated by the people of the empire that she cannot go out in public because she will almost definitely be assassinated. So. Our protagonist, Amani, is basically drafted to die in the place of this cruel princess. So first of all we have a setting that I'm really excited for because I never read enough sci-fi fantasy and this combines my favourite elements of both, court drama and the expanse of space and its beauty and stars and moons and distant travel and all that sort of stuff. Um, as well as a princess archetype that we don't see enough of. Usually when we see a cruel princess, she's set up as a foil against like a good princess or like a shy, kind, sort of introverted princess. This is just a cruel princess unleashed on her people. Um, and the back does hint at kind of the potentials of a, a romance or a love triangle because it brings up uh, Amani's growing bond to the princess's fiance, who naturally she has to do a lot of public appearances with. I'm, I'm not one for romance, or especially not love triangles, but um, I am interested to see in the kind of interpersonal relationship dramas that can come from impersonating another person, um, having to fulfill their role, and people being aware of that, some people more than others, but still having to pretend, I think that could be a really interesting plot line. Also, um, you know, just the idea of overthrowing a cruel empire or taking it down from within and all that sort of stuff is always so much fun. It has both a star system map and like a traditional fantasy continent map. That's how you know it's going to be a good book. And after that, well, not necessarily after that, but something else that I want to read this month is Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri. So this one is uh, uh, just plain down on the ground fantasy. I was gonna say earth fantasy but the whole point is that it's not on earth. Dirt fantasy which is such a nice way to talk about something that looks so intense and luscious. This is another story about a young girl grappling with the reign of a cruel empire. Wow, I wonder why there are so many stories about that now. It's almost as if people are growing up under the threat of a large system that will keep us all down and in service to us. I said in service to us, in service to it. Oh my gosh, I just ruined my stupid rant. Okay. Capitalism bad. There's, there's my rant over. I have the brain of a walnut. Not even the size of a walnut, 
Just a walnut for a brain. Empire of Sand's protagonist is Mare, whose father is an aristocrat in this big scary empire, but her mother is from a small nomadic tribe. Um, so as you can imagine, this is a pretty fraught union, and growing up, Mare doesn't really know where she belongs within this empire, or what her status should be, or what her identity is. But, um, for reasons not given on the back, but I presume has something to do with this unique dual status, um, Mare is cornered by the mystics of the empire, and pretty much forced to join their ranks um, through threats and an arranged marriage, and also the gods are mad. That's what you want. All those things coming down at you at once when you're already struggling with trying to figure out who you are. So, Tasha Suri, the author, is a British uh, Sikh woman, and this story has a lot of influences from medieval India, and I'm very excited to see that setting. Um, I honestly haven't read uh, any Indian fantasy, which is a real shame, because, first of all, just look at this knife on the cover, you can tell everything's going to be absolutely gorgeous. I know very little of Indian history prior to the Raj, and so I'm really keen. I know this is obviously is not a historical text, but when I study history, I'm less interested in actual events and more in the lived realities of the people at the time. So I'm keen to see, you know, just the, the sort of social influences, the sort of just the way people lived and interacted with each other, how all. It's, the nitty gritty details always get me. That was one of the things that I always liked about Realm of the Elderlings, is when Fitz was out living in his little hut, you got a real sense of like, this is where he gets his eggs from and to take care of his chickens, he has to build this coop which he gets by chopping down these trees which are also important for his firewood, which he also builds his furniture out of and they take care of this and they go over here to do this and this guy over here raises pigs. And I'm interested just in like, you know the little details like that, it's like, oh, is your diet include dairy, or is that something more for upper classes? Is it like, oh, you're nomadic? Like, what sort of areas do you go to? What range of climates are you living in? Are you equipped only for living in deserts? Like you said, the, the spirits of the sand play a key role in their culture. Does she have much experience with agriculture then, being nomadic? You know, just... All of these little things, you know, I'm really interested in just seeing the different experiences here. Which is a weird thing to take away from a book that advertises being about fighting against the vengeance of the gods themselves in an empire where your father is part of the ruling class. But hey, I never really did care about angry gods. That's a very obtuse reference to the way a series I used to like ended but didn't and it's not a very popular series so you wouldn't know what I'm talking about anyway. If you comprehended any of those ramblings, I am incredibly impressed. And sorry. But that those are the books that I have thus far for the Asian readathon and I'm very excited to get into all of them except for the ones that I've already gotten into because I couldn't wait and because I couldn't make myself make a video. Hopefully I'll be able to read more translated works this month because as I said I only have Nagata Kabi's book um, and I wanted to expand my reading space beyond just yeah, the majority of translated stuff I read is just manga like this um, and I wanted to get into translated stuff from other languages. For example, I've been really interested in reading Xi Jin Lu's stuff. Um, my exposure to Chinese fantasy has basically just been limited to wuxia stuff, um, but he writes a lot more uh, futuristic fantasy, some sci-fi, and uh, a lot less traditional fantasy in general that I'm really interested in reading. Um, there I go. I don't know why I do this, but I don't like sitting still. I'll be doing recaps on all these books, um, and that is a good segue to get into talking about my solo exchange diary number two. This one. So, obviously this is a volume two of a sequel series, so if you haven't read My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness, 
what are you doing with your life? Go out and read that right now. My video is terrible. That book is fantastic. Goodbye. I don't want to see you back here. If you have read uh, My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness but you have not read volume one of my solo exchange diary, um, I guess whether you want to or not depends on how much you got out of My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness. I feel um, as a lonely lesbian, uh, it meant a lot to me and continuing to see Nagata Kabi grow and develop as a person um, really, you know, stuck with me. It was something I wanted to continue seeing happen. Um, so I, I really got invested in my solo exchange diary. But the thing is, this is a lot more... Um, it's It's got the word diary in the title and honestly it does feel like a, a drawn diary. Um, and that's, she, she writes serialized as things happen. The thing about My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness is that it was her first work, it was, it, it drew on all of her life leading up to a climactic moment that she had deliberately identified as the crux of a narrative. This is just stuff that happens to her and if you care about her, if you're interested in seeing um, the highs and lows of recovery of mental illness then I think you would like this um, but if you're interested in more of a straightforward narrative that you could follow that had traditional narrative threads a firm well it wasn't really like a firm resolution but it definitely felt like a climax and then a do um, I I honestly don't think you would enjoy this as much um, before the series is finished and I'm pretty sure this isn't finished because it closes the same way all of her diary entries and um, with you're already in the future, how's it going out there? So, you know, it opens, it's a solo exchange diary she writes to herself back and forth. It, it opens up for a reply from herself in the future, which I presume will be volume three. Um, all that said, if you are interested in my solo exchange diary and you have read the first one and you haven't read the second one, um, I don't want to give like spoilers, but at the same time I feel weird about labeling someone's personal life as spoilers Especially because a lot of the stuff that's important to her is like happening in the world and people know about it before it's in uh, a published manga because she's just living like this out there with the, the people in her life It's an interesting book to talk about because I don't want to to evaluate it on like traditional narrative terms because this is just things that happen to her. Um, the previous uh, volume of My Soul Exchange Diary ended with her kind of getting asked out by a girl. The girl was like, I I'm not sure if you're interested in me romantically but I'd like to have any kind of relationship with you even if it just ends up being like a casual friendship. And then she, she mentions in here that like, oh I never spoke to that girl again. It was like the climactic ending of volume one and then it's like, that went nowhere. That's how life is, is the thing. And if you aren't prepared to deal with plot threads getting raised to high importance and then just falling away into nothingness like they happen in reality, then you wouldn't really like this. But if you do want an honest kind of look at someone's emotions play by play as they go, then I think you'd enjoy it. Um, as, as I've said, this is, has a lot to do with her mental health, a lot more to do with her mental health than it does with uh, her being a lesbian. Um, I think you could actually tell that coming through in my lesbian experience with loneliness. The loneliness obviously came from a lot of growing up being gay in a community and a family that didn't really welcome that. Um, in my sort of exchange diary she talks about the reaction of her family, how she hadn't expected anyone to read it at all, she'd kind of avoided giving it out to f people and she was really quite moved when her some of her family members said they really enjoyed it but they didn't mention the subject matter at all which basically ignoring it is a kind of the best she could hope for and obviously that led to a lot of the loneliness but the loneliness also comes from you know having severe depression, she mentions a lot about how um, not being in a traditional um, structured kind of environment like school or university or work meant that it was really difficult to make friends which I really emphasise with because I'm at uni but here at uni in Australia um, you live at home and you just need to go to campus for like an hour or two then you go back home and sit in your room and you talk about books to your iPhone taped to a lamp
where I'm getting at with this is because it deals with a lot of mental health problems there are a lot of warnings if you haven't read this series it does involve self-harm this is something she has struggled with personally and she talks very eloquently about it but she does also depict it um, in the images because it's manga everything's illustrated um, that was kind of difficult for me to handle I can't really take graphic depictions of that um, it crops up again in this one uh, interestingly it was easier for me to handle because she was using just whatever she had at hand in a spur of the moment thing it wasn't like a premeditated th thing it was just more of a, a, an absolute panic kind of thing to deal with which is more just interesting for me knowing how my psyche works um, this one also includes uh, problems with alcoholism as you can probably tell from the cover where she's you know out of her mind holding a giant can of beer um, but if you don't mind uh, actually I don't want to give a spoiler review of this like I said I feel weird talking about spoilers or non-spoilers in terms of this so I'm not going to talk about what happens to her in this I just want to say that it had a more concrete hopeful ending for me than volume one volume one ending with the promise of maybe beginning to get to know that girl who reached out to her didn't even feel that much of an achievement <laughs> achievement that's so weird this is a real thing that happened to a real person didn't feel like a good high point ending for me um, I, I, I liked volume 2 a lot more than I liked volume 1 um, interesting enough um, I feel like this one I'm trying to say that this one's ending feels a lot more like um, Nagata Kabi went through genuine kind of recovery stages and she's made a lot more genuine progress than volume one felt and obviously that's just part of the fact that um, progress takes time um, you can t this isn't a spoiler because it's on the back she gets hospitalized for a little in this one and I feel like some of the realizations that come through being in a hospital environment some of the conversations she has with doctors really helped her out um, but also it in this one you can really get a sense that she's addressing a lot of the root issues she's had with her family it's very very family focused this one um, and I think that again weird to analyze this in like a narrative structure but that feels like really getting to the core of the issue in way back in my lesbian experience with loneliness that I feel like is really helping her out so again this feels so weird analyzing it as a book but story-wise this one is better than volume one and again what I was alluding to with it's hard to be a spoiler when it's the thing that's happened in the world but um, this she's finally getting back to writing original fiction manga as, as well as her autobiographical manga um, and it includes a sample chapter of Chika-chan's depression which as you can tell draws a lot from her personal experiences but is also really well drawn, really well designed, has a really like cool and unique concept, um, great art. Writing is very, it's very first chapter manga, um, just establishing stuff, but I, I feel like what it establishes is fun, unique, and potentially thought-provoking enough that uh, I'm keen to see where this series goes. I really hope it gets published in English, I really hope that uh, it continues on for a while um, and Nagata makes some good money off it because I don't know I just want the best for this woman she's been through so much and she's had the courage to put it out there where people all over the planet can see what she's going through on a very raw and unflattering image um, and it's been really good for me to see someone go through the highs and lows of recovery in such an intense personal and intimate way I really appreciate it and if you especially if you're gay and or struggling with mental illness or both or you have empathy I really recommend starting with my lesbian experience with loneliness and then if you're okay with kind of that open-ended narrative unfolding as it goes thing checking out my solo exchange diary because it's a really good series and it's funny <laughs> I have this super secret locked Twitter that I only give out to like real close friends so pretty much no one watching this is gonna have access to it but 
that's all right because it's just where I complain about being sad. Um, but the banner image for that I have continually taken from My Lesbian Experience of the Loneliness and then Volume 1 and 2 of Solo Exchange Diary and every time a, a new one of those is published um, I, I take a, a picture of a panel from here and I turn it into the banner image and over time they have gotten more hopeful and more positive and uh, that helps me too as well as being a really nice reflection to see of someone growing and becoming a happier healthier person so Again, really like this. Like it better than volume one. Check it out. And that is where I'm going to stop rambling for today. I have taken up far too much of your time already. I appreciate you having a look at all my crazy crap um, and stupid ramblings about an event that I think has much greater importance than my nonsense has given it credit for. Please check out Read with Cindy, but if you watch booktube videos, I know you already have and I know you already love her because she is amazing. Um, but also check out the Asian Readathon Twitter because that's where everyone's kind of Twitter talk about the Readathon is going. Um, it'll give you links to the playlist for all the videos for the Asian Readathon that have already been made because people got their TBRs ahead of time instead of me who waited until a couple of days into May to talk about what I wanted to read in May. Cindy's going to be hosting a live show on the 25th of May to be talking about a thousand beginnings and endings and she's going to have several other hosts on there which I alluded to at the beginning but you should also definitely check out their channels and that's got a thing for things which is Sandra and reading solace but with two X's on either side and that's Kaz who's a non-binary lesbian like me there's books with Chloe who as you may guess is named Chloe and in a similar vein there's Elias whose channel is Elias reads they all have primo channel titles Whereas mine is my full name. If you're someone who wants to be a writer, I don't have any creativity. But check those guys out. Make sure to check out the Asian the Asian Readathon Twitter, which has links to the Google Doc, which is this great big list of books that fulfill the challenges. Um, some of them that fulfill all of the challenges, even. Um, but you know the challenges are broken down into what books fit them, and they have lists of what authors match what nationality because I forgot to mention that the big overarching challenge for the readathon is that each book you read has to be from someone from a different nationality which I got but I, I didn't like point that out because I forgot it was a rule I, I remembered it was a rule but I forgot I had to point it out Anyway, the point is, if you want to join in on this readathon but you're not sure where to start, you're not sure what books come well recommended while also meeting the challenges, if you forgot what the challenges are because I said them like a million years ago at the beginning of this really long and boring video, check out that Google Doc, check out the Twitter, I already plugged the Twitter, I've plugged everything like 50 times, but it's important that you check these out because Cindy put a lot of effort into all of this and a lot of people put a lot of effort into the Google Doc contributing things that they enjoy, things that they found were really authentic and uh, fit the challenges and stuff like that and I think it's really cool the amount of work that went into this and I'm very excited to read the books that I have not already read so I hope you all have a good day and if at the very least consider checking out something written by an Asian author this May because there's plenty of them and a lot of really good books out there so why the hell not?